The British Nobel Prize winning zoologist, Dr. Peter, Peter Metamore, once wrote, among scientists are collectors, classifiers, and compulsive tidier ups. And many are detectives by temperament, many are explorers, some are artists and some are artisans. And there are also poet scientists and philosopher scientists and even a few mystics. Dr. Giovanni Fazio of the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory has had a long and exemplary, exemplary career over a range of fields here at the Smithsonian that began here at the Smithsonian in 1962. He is one of our philosopher scientists, and today we honor him with a distinguished lecture award. Long before we, in our strategic planning process, identified unlocking the mysteries of the universe as one of the themes for the future, Dr. Fazio was doing just that. The goal of astronomy is to understand how the universe works and how we got here. Dr. Fazio's work has greatly enhanced our understanding of the universe, especially energy particles. Dr. Fazio spent decades studying some of the highest energy light waves from space, gamma rays, and some of the lowest energy light waves, infrared. And he was a trailblazer in studying both long before others did. He's a versatile, trails, versatile trailblazer in that he built instruments, launched observatories, and devised, devised new ways of looking at the universe. He is an innovator in astro astronomical technology. He initiated the construction of the 10-meter optical reflector at the Whipple Observatory in Arizona to search for ultra-high-energy cosmic gamma rays. In 1979, he used a giant helium balloon to loft a two-ton, 20-foot-long telescope to the upper reaches of the atmosphere, where it gathered infrared light from stars, galaxies, and even the planet Jupiter. And at the end of the flight, they remotely cut a tether between the telescope and the balloon, letting the, the car-sized telescope parachute back to Earth, hoping it wouldn't land in someone's pond or hit their house. Now, I had a conversation at lunch with Dr. Fazio, and he corrected my remarks by telling me he lofted many such objects into space, not one time. And he has many interesting stories about where these things came down, <laughs> including roads, swamps in Mexico, and on one rancher's front yard in Texas. And this Texan had a six gun. And when he got up in the morning and saw this strange object in his front yard, he took his six gun after that thing. <laughs> but I understand it still worked. You got the data out of it, even though it was a little dented by the time he got it out. Well, Dr. Fazio led the design and development of the infrared array camera, a primary instrument of the Spitzer Space Telescope. This camera takes Hubble quality infrared photographs of the cosmos, and he's made a number of remarkable discoveries since its 2003 launch. For example, in 2005, using the camera, camera that Dr. Fazio and his colleagues designed, astronomers made the first direct detection of light from a distant alien world. In 2007, they made the first weather map of Jupiter. Dr. Fazio has received numerous awards before this one, including four NASA Group Achievement Awards, the Unico National Marconi Science Medal, and the NASA Public Service Medal. And in 2008, the Royal Society of London gave him their Massey Award for outstanding achievements in space science. He is currently a member of the Space Telescope Institute Council, the American Astronomical Society, the International Astronomical Union, and the Optical Society of America. He is a fellow of the American Physical Society, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the Royal Astronomical Society. He's been a member of numerous national and international advisory committees as an author of more than 350 publications in scientific journals. He has set a sterling example for all scientists and scholars to follow. And I'm told he still attracts legions of young students at Harvard, where it's hard to attract young students. One colleague wrote his quiet resolve and genteel ways have inspired scientists, graduate students, and engineers, and all personnel required to carry out his complicated research. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome 
a most distinguished Smithsonian scholar, Dr. Giovanni Fazio. Okay. Okay. This, I'm told this part is very heavy. Okay. This part comes off. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary Clough, for that very generous introduction, and it is indeed a great honor for me to be here and to receive this award today from you. However, I would not be standing here if it were not for the many people who made my research career possible. First of all, I want to thank all my graduate students. Uh, my research achievements, again, would have been impossible without them, and I'm sure I learned more from them than they did from me. I also want to thank the many scientists, engineers, and technicians that I've worked with over the years. They really made my research uh, work possible. Also, I want to thank all of the managers, administrators, and support staff that made it possible to carry out my research. But most of all, I want to thank the project and acknowledge a project that I've spent uh, half my career on, that is the infrared array camera on the Spitzer Space Telescope and the mainly that outstanding support team that helped me make this mission such a success. They're really an amazing group of people and I owe them an awful lot. A special thanks also go to the directors of SAO for their combined continued support of my research and particularly when times got pretty tough and they got pretty tough at times. And also finally I want to thank my wife Suzanne and my family, my relatives and friends who, uh, for their constant help and support over the years. It's been invaluable. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, today I'm going to tell you about a new view of the universe that was made with the Spitzer Space Telescope. But before I, st I start here, let me first explain a little bit about what infrared radiation is. This is the electromagnetic spectrum. And you can see we start at this end with very short wavelength, very energetic rays and gamma rays. And then as the wavelength gets longer, I go this way with X-rays, ultraviolet, visible, infrared, and then finally radio over here. So you see the infrared lies between the visible and the radio, and in fact infrared means above the red. So it starts at the red end and goes to the visible end. And also, you notice how narrow the, our optical, the optical spectrum is, and most of our view of the universe has really been confined to this very narrow region of the spectrum. But the infrared part is a thousand times wider in wavelength range than this narrow visible wavelength band. So this is the region we're going to uh, talk about. Now, also associated with every um, uh, wavelength is a temperature, and I'm going to put that scale up now. And you can see uh, the infrared uh, part of the spectrum is, is a, associated with a very cold temperature. That is, bodies at this temperature will radiate most of their radiation in the infrared. Now, if actually there's a range of temperatures, and I'll put those up here. So the infrared range goes from about minus 450 Fahrenheit to 6,000. Well, now you can argue, well, 6,000 is not exactly cold. No, that's true. But uh, in terms of the, uh, of the universe, it's a cold, it's a cold uh, object. Here you see in the visible lane, uh, 17,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The surface of our sun is at uh, 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And you can go up to the X-ray and gamma ray range. We go into the millions of degrees Fahrenheit and billions of degrees Fahrenheit here. But the main thing I want to get over here is that we're talking about cold objects in space that would have been invisible to optical or visible telescopes. Now the next thing is how do we present infrared pictures? 
The first thing you, you notice, since we can't see infrared radiation, we, have, we use what we call false colors. So we color the, each wavelength in the infrared either by temperature or by uh, way according to wavelength. So here, dark is cold temperatures and, and white is hot temperatures. You can see this is a very healthy dog. He has a very cold nose over here. And, and you see his eyes are warm, but interesting, you can see his ears, but you can't see his body because the fur is insulating the heat from his body. It's interesting, in infrared radiation, we can't see it, but we can feel it. It's, it's, it's an interesting, interesting concept. So the pictures I'm going to present to you today are actually false, what we call false color images. I have to color them with colors we can see. And I'll do this to the images that will be presented today. Now, why do we study infrared radiation? There's four very, very good reasons. First of all, and I, we just discussed it, that the universe is, a good part of it is very, very cold. And most of the objects in the universe are just too cool to be seen in visible light. So we're missing a lot of the universe. The second one is the universe is distant and expanding. Because the universe is expanding, objects far away from us move faster and faster. And the further they away, the faster they move. As a result of this, when they admit uh, radiation, electromagnetic radiation, say like light, the light is stretched due to the expansion of the universe and we see, for example, optical light, we would see it at infrared. So if you want to study the uh, objects at the very beginning of the universe, very distant objects, we have to look into the infrared. Very important. The next thing is the universe is dusty. There's two important properties of infrared radiation here. First of all, the infrared radiation can penetrate dusty regions, and we can see inside dusty regions. You can't do that with a visible telescope. And second, the uh, dust itself uh, in the universe radiates from the infrared, usually heated by stars, and it converts the energy to uh, stellar energy into infrared radiation, which we can see. So it's a good way of mapping where the dust is in the universe. And finally, the chemical universe. Many of the atoms and molecules uh, uh, emit radiation in the infrared, and particularly important are the organic molecules. Find most of their energy emitted in the infrared, and these could be biogenic uh, and the, uh, molecules, for example. And if we want to search for evidences of life in other places, doing it in the infrared is the place to look. Now here, uh, I, again, an example of how the universe look, can be quite different. On the left, I have the Orion Nebula, as you would see it in the sky. Uh, there you are. Um, Orion constellation, as you would see it in the sky. Here's the belt of Orion, the sword of Orion here. It, this is how it looked visible to your eye when you look up in the sky. If you had infrared eyes, this is what you would see here. One of the things I forgot to mention before, you know, the temperature of this room is at 70 degrees Kelvin, and if you had infrared eyes, you would be blinded in here. It would be so, so bright. Okay. But here what you're seeing is dust. This red stuff is all dust. The white hot stuff is where st new stars are being born, heating up the dust even more. But the idea when I get over here is just look how different it is when you look at different wavelengths. Uh, like you see a completely different universe. And the only way we can really understand the full universe is to look at all of these wavelengths and then put the picture together. And one way of doing this is with NASA's great observatories. One of the problems with most of the electromagnetic spectrum is that it's absorbed by the atmosphere, and therefore we can't detect it from the ground. So we have to go up into space to see it. And NASA has this wonderful series of observatories to cover all parts of the spectrum here. And again, you can see, looking at the same place in different wavelengths here, you get completely different pictures of the universe. Um, the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory here on this side has now come down, and there's a new one up called the Fermi gamma ray space telescope which is but all four of these now are up and operating right now and it's been uh, incredible to have all, uh, have this all this information available to, at one time and it is really a golden age and i even say a platinum age of astronomy today yeah. it's really a very very exciting times this is the uh, spitzer space telescope um, uh, it's a, a telescope is rather small. It's only 85 centimeter mirror in it, but we have to cool it to minus 450 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. One of the reasons for this, as I mentioned, this room or the telescope that would, we would build would be radiating the infrared itself. So to get rid of that background radiation, we have to make it very cold so that the 
amount of infrared radiation that would make, make noise in our detectors is gone away. And we have to cool even the detectors even more. And there are three camera, two cameras in here, a mid-infrared and a far-infrared camera, and a spectrometer. The spectrometer is no more than a means, it's like a prism. It can take the infrared radiation and divide it up into its uh, colors, just like you see the optical light divided up into the, to the rainbow of colors. We do that in the infrared also, and, and can use that spectrometer then to identify certain molecules and atoms. Now, this telescope was launched Oops, go back. This telescope was uh, launched in August 25, 2003, but we first funded to build it in 1984, right? 20, almost 20 years on this. Uh, uh, so uh, it just shows you uh, how long, and it was canceled, the project was almost canceled twice by, by NASA. And uh, uh, when I mentioned before, uh, Directors of SAO helping me get out of problems. This was one of them, right? So, um, also, it's in a very unusual orbit. It doesn't orbit the Earth, but it's orbiting the Sun. In fact, it's trailing the Earth, it's trailing the Earth as it goes around the Sun. I'll get back to that in a minute. I'll show you before. To, to get the temperature this cold, we use liquid helium, and this liquid helium has a lifetime of about six years. And in fact, if you, just adding up here, you can see that it ran out of helium just this last May. But however, the uh, telescope still remained cold enough that uh, two of the mid-infrared cameras detectors are still working, and we anticipate we can go another five years of operation if NASA continues to fund us. And again, the total cost of this mission up to the launch was about $670 million. Here's the insides of the telescope. You can see the, the, the light comes in here, goes off this primary mirror, bounces up to the secondary mirror, and then comes down. This is where the instruments are located, and the liquid helium is stored down in this vessel down here. Uh, it's like a, uh, uh, like a door uh, that you would, you know, st store liquid nitrogen in similar design and everything. And um, it's holding about 360 liters of helium. It's imagined that it lasted uh, for over uh, six years. Now here are the star trackers, the electronics, and down here the antenna is down here below. One side always faces the sun. The solar panels are on the outside. This is a shield behind the solar panel to keep the heat from getting to this uh, telescope. And you, you can see the observatory is about uh, four meters tall and uh, it has a mass of about uh, 900 uh, kilograms. These are the three instruments uh, in the thing. Uh, uh, I'm the principal investigator on the infrared array cam. You'll hear me talk to, call it IRAC here. And SAO was the lead institution on that camera. Uh, the other one is the far infrared camera, which is uh, built by George Rickey at Arizona. And, um, and the infrared uh, spectrograph here the, uh, is built by Jim, Jim Houck at Cornell. Okay, and you can see the three instruments located here. So the light from the telescope comes down here, and then it's divided up into the three instruments. Now, one of the reasons that this telescope became so sensitive was the really incredible advances that have been made in infrared imaging. Uh, it started out with the Defense Department because infrared uh, cameras are very good for tracking missiles also. So the Defense Department was always very, very interested in the development of these. Yet, we had to really uh, rework the detectors from the military to make them more sensitive for astronomy. But back in 1967, uh, we had one detector. And what we did, to, this was a scan through the center of our galaxy, which, which is a very strong source of infrared radiation. And you just did it by moving back and forth like this and, and mapping. And this stuff would come out on a chart recorder, and you'd make comments on the pen here. This is 1967. Since then, we now have two-dimensional arrays, just like the, uh, the arrays in your uh, digital cameras now, right? Only they're sensitive in the infrared. And today, this is a picture that we can make of the center of our galaxy. You can see we've come a long, long way. And now, instead of one pixel, we have millions of pixels here uh, to make this image. Okay. So this is the uh, camera itself. It was built at the Goddard Space Flight Center, and I'm very grateful to them for doing an incredible job. It's only about a foot cubed here. 
and you can see it over here in more detail. The light comes into this pick-off mirror here, goes in down here. The lenses are, and mirrors are in here, and it sends it off to the two cameras here. And below this, this dock right in here is another set identical to this where there's two more cameras, so four in the middle. Now this little box right here costs $45 million to build, okay? And at one time, there were more than 200 people working on this to build it because it was just pushing the technology so much. Okay. Gives you a little feeling. This was the rocket. Uh, I always keep this picture here because I'll never forget it. First of all, I was happy to see this telescope. The telescope is just in this little section up in here. I was happy to see this telescope go up after 20 years of work, but also after 20 years of work, knowing that my life's, half my life's work is sitting on top of this flaming rocket <laughs> and could explode at any minute does not do well for one's blood pressure. <laughs> but it, it was a great, a great, a, a great, uh, great step forward. And now you can see this is an artist drawing. This is the telescope itself. Here you can see it in solar orbit. It's, it's following the Earth around. Here's the moon and the Earth. And uh, it's gradually drifting away from us right now. And it's actually taking data right now. We're in the, the warm mode. The helium has been exhausted. So the infrared array camera, which I help uh, build, is functioning. And it's taking data right now. And this spacecraft is about um, uh, 60 million miles away from us uh, right now. So it's uh, been uh, uh, quite, uh, uh, quite an achievement. And also, being out in this orbit it has many advantages. You're away from the Earth, the heat of the Earth, which would help evaporate the helium faster. And also, the Earth doesn't get in your way when you observe. So you can, we are observing 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And um, the efficiency time on target gets up to 85 or 90 percent, which is really great. For example, the Hubble runs about 40 percent because it's in low Earth orbit. OK, now let me show some of the science that's been uh, Secretary Clough mentioned about the, um, uh, the discovery of exoplanets is one of the main discoveries of, uh, of the Spitzer Space Telescope. And these are, uh, exoplanets are really just planets around other stars. And there's now some 400 of these exoplanets known uh, um, right now. And Spitzer is studying a special class of those. That is what we call transiting uh, planets. These are planets which when viewed from the Earth you can see cross in front and behind uh, their star. And they're a particular class that we can really study in detail and I'm going to show you this in the next slide. Now here's the, you can see the planet here going around its star. This is an artist's conception, right? So these particular, this is a transiting exoplanet now. And particularly valuable is that when it goes behind the star, you can see the radiation dips and then comes back up when it goes. So this difference between here, which is a star plus the planet, and just the planet below it, then gives us a measure of just the amount of radiation, infrared radiation, that came from the planet itself. Okay. And then uh, what you do is you look at this dip right here, and then this difference tells you how much uh, came. And this... And this was done uh, with, uh, by David Charbonneau at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. And the lower one, using the MIPS camera, uh, was uh, done by um, um, the group at the Goddard uh, Space Flight Center, Dwight uh, uh, Deming. Now, what, when, when we first launched Spitzer, there was no way, if you would have asked me, can you see an exoplanet, I'd say, no way. I would have bet anything that you couldn't have seen it. Uh, an exoplanet. So this came as a complete surprise. And one of the things, you can see the difficulty of this measurement, that this dip down here is less than a tenth of a percent in the flux. So, and you have to measure it over many, many hours. So it requires incredible stability on, on, on part of the instruments to do this. But it was done, and it was the first time then we detected light from an exoplanet. I say I'm using we in here all the time. I really mean a large group. Uh, I don't me just mean my own, my own research here. Now, another thing, how can we measure the temperature of an extrasolar planet? You see at different infrared wavelengths over here, you can see the drop as it goes behind is different. 
So by measuring it at different wavelengths, we can then deduce from this what the temperature of the planet is. Okay, so that's how we determine its, its temperature. And the ones we've seen thus far are really very hot. Most of them we've seen are uh, bigger, as big, are bigger than Jupiter, and they're very, very hot. These planets are typically orbiting at, at, in orbits which are less than the, than the uh, orbit of Mercury. Here's one, uh, this is an artist's conception of a so-called hot planet which is very, very close to a star. Now another incredible uh, ad advance w which was made also by uh, Heather Knudsen at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics was a so-called exoplanet weather report, actually mapping the temperature uh, on another planet, the whole uh, temperature around, around the surface of the planet. And the way this was done is that when the planet goes in front of the star here, you get this, in step number one here, you get this large dip as it blocks part of the starlight from the, from the original star. But then as it continues to go around, you begin to see different phases, just like you see different phases of the moon, and begin to, uh, this gradually increases as it goes around to you, to, uh, you almost see the front of the face just before it goes in. So at two, you're seeing this, this gradual rise as you see more and more of the planet. And the data is taken continually uh, as this goes around, and then this therefore allows you and this step right up here, and then this dip here is when it goes behind. Uh, from this rise here, then you can deduce the temperature as a function of longitude around the planet. And this map was produced here uh, by uh, Heather Knudsen. And the uh, first thing you notice that the line closest to the, uh, to the, uh, to the star at zero degrees here, uh, the brightest spot is not off, it's off by 30 degrees. This planet is locked. Uh, just like the moon is locked in orbit around the earth, this planet is locked so one face always faces the, the star. And here you can see the temperatures are really quite hot. The peak here is about 1700 degrees Fahrenheit and off the side here is 1200. So it's not a very habitable planet for, for life. This is a, so this was another, no way we just had no, no idea that we would ever, ever see this. And also what has been discovered is water vapor on these hot Jupiters. Again, this is by looking at, this is the, uh, from the infrared array, the mid-infrared array camera over here. You can see this is the theoretical spectrum and this is the data that was measured. And we've also found methane and CO2 in these atmospheres. So we're beginning to even now get the composition of the atmospheres of these exoplanets. Okay, let me go on to another topic now, made, and this is the uh, birth of stars in our galaxy. Where are stars born? Well, this is a galaxy. It's an island of stars, an island universe of stars, maybe 200 billion stars in it. Uh, our Milky Way is very similar to this. And stars are born in the spiral arms of these, of these galaxies. And um, I'm going to show you... This is a, from a picture from the Hubble Space Telescope. But these clouds, which are in the space between the stars, um, are dense clouds of gas and dust. And uh, when they, they become over-dense, they begin to collapse. And I'll show you the next series. Here the cloud, when the inside of the cloud begins to collapse, the cloud is usually rotating also. So the gas pours in by gravity into the center and starts heating up the inside here. And pretty soon then, the uh, inside uh, object becomes so hot in its center that nuclear fusion occurs just like in a hydrogen bomb and it starts to heat up and, and start glowing. But and the material continues to fall in, but it doesn't fall straight in. It comes in on a disk and rotates in and then finally falls into the star. And mysteriously, which we don't fully understand, there's an outflow also going on. You would think when you're trying to form a star, you want all the material to fall in, but nature somehow has managed to get this outflow. So pretty soon the star continues to grow on the inside here and it gets warmer and warmer and becomes hotter and hotter and it begins to blow away this extra dust around it and pretty soon we're left with this disk and the star in the center and then the material in the disk begins to, uh, to uh, coagulate together and pretty soon we end up with a uh, solar system here. You can see this, um, this process uh, can take um, more than, uh, than uh, 10, 10 million years or so to occur, but that's sort of the typical time scale with this, with this going. Now, one of the advantages of the Spitzer Space Telescope and looking in the infrared is that we, we, there's, a, there's a definite uh, signature 
at each stage of this, there's a definite infrared signature that we get. So when we look into the galaxy and look at these dark clouds, uh, by noting the signature that we see, we can tell which one of these stages that it's in. And this has been an incredible advantage now in understanding uh, how stars are born, how our own solar system and our, our sun and our own solar system formed. And it, what is, it was difficult, if not impossible, to try to do this from the ground. So here's an uh, artist's conception um, of the disk, and this is the jet shooting out, and, this, and the planets, you can see them beginning to form uh, on the inside of this disk here. Now here's some uh, examples of this, which was taken with the Spitzer. Here we have a visible image. You can see this dark cloud, a very dense cloud. You can't see the stars behind it. It's blocking all the optical light. But then we looked in the infrared, and we saw this, which is rather amazing. Here are the two jets shooting out. You can't see the disk. The, star, the light from the star in the center is so bright you can't see, but there's a disk in here perpendicular to the jet. And what we've been able to do with Spitzer's uh, spectrometer, uh, looking at the, at the composition of the material in this disk, the dusk in this disk, is that we, we uh, found, lo and behold, there's water, methyl alcohol, methane, organic compounds, silicates, like sand, water, ice, and carbon dioxide, which is so, um, many uh, organic molecules are already beginning to appear. And then even more spectacularly, we're starting to see acetylene and hydrogen cyanide, which are the basis, essentially, for amino acids, and also one of the cross-links in DNA, right? So this is incredible. In that disk, before the planets formed, all these organic molecules, which are, you know, could lead to eventually to life, were there, were present, including water, which is shown in the next one, right? Water and carbon dioxide were also in this disk long before the planets even formed. Amazing. Here's another example. This is a dark molecular cloud. Here you can you see, and it's very dense of uh, dust. You can see the rim of it right here being lit up by very bright stars shining on it. But you can't, these stars are in the foreground. You can't see the stars like here that are in the background. And then when we look with the Spitzer Space Telescope, this is what we found. Here is this cluster of stars being born inside this cloud right here. So astronomers are interested in how many stars formed, what is their mass distribution. Uh, and, uh, and not only that, we can go in and tell which one of these, by looking at the colors with Spitzer, we can tell which ones have disks, which ones are still collapsing, and things like this. So it's been a very valuable. And even to have a more spectacular example here. This is a region called uh, W5. It's a very, very large region. And just to give you a scale here, there's 30 light years. This area is about the size of four full moons on the sky. Very, very large area. But an incredible stage of, um, of here you see uh, this red part is very, very hot dust here. And then the green part is colder molecular clouds. And the, hot, the white stuff is where the new stars are being born. So these, each infrared color tells us a little bit different. And then when you look over here, these green dots are where the stars are being born. The regular green dots are those stars with, still with disk around them. And you, it may be difficult to see, but the green circles with the dots in the center are where the, star, where the clouds are still collapsing. You can see in these very dense regions here, the collapse is still going on. But you notice there's waves of stars here and then new waves going on here. So it looks like there's almost a sequential star formation occurring in these things. These areas are blown out here. The red is hot dust, remember. They're blown out here by very, very hot stars in here. So for, for the first time, we're really getting a complete picture of, of what's going on within our own galaxy that we just, just never had before. Amazing. And now I'm going to uh, blow up a region uh, right down in here. Okay, this region here, I'm going to blow that up now so you can see that in more detail. And this is uh, what you see. Again, the brown is uh, dust on the surface of the molecular clouds. You can see this is the white areas where stars are being born. You notice they're always at the tips. This, this cloud is being eroded away by very bright stars which are off the screen, impacting on this and eating away at it, except for the most dense regions here. These little green things you see at the end are these jets that are shooting out of the many stars being born in there. Incredible. OK, let me go on to another fascinating topic. And this is the topic of uh, brown dwarfs. A brown dwarf is sort of a star that fizzled. It didn't have enough mass in the beginning, 
to collapse and to heat up the interior, so it, it sort of formed. This is an artist's concept. Um, uh, it formed and then started just gradually cooling, never made it. Typically, uh, these stars are about a tenth of the solar mass, but they can get as small as a few times uh, Jupiter's mass. Anyway, so it's sort of a, an object that's between stars and, and planets. And they're so cold that you can never see them in the uh, visible light unless they're very near a star or something in, from the reflected light. So this has been a real realm of discovery for, um, for the Spitzer Space Telescope and infrared astronomy, and many, many of these have now been discovered. But one of the most fascinating aspects of these is in the next picture, in that we discovered disks around these stars also. So, so here you have an object which is a little bit more heavier than Jupiter, perhaps, with this disk of uh, planetary material around it, such that planets could form around that star, or planets around another planet. Okay. And therefore, you can have, it's possible, we have not detected one of these, but it, since we see this, uh, and uh, it's possible to have miniature solar systems with a brown dwarf at the center and planets around it. And this has gotten the interest of astronomers, and, and particularly those searching for life, and that this is a very cool system and would be very ideal uh, to, form, to form life around such systems. And these things may be, are, may be around, and in fact, they may even be closer than the nearest star to us, and, and we have just not seen them yet. So we're continually on the outlook for these. Uh, okay, now another big uh, step forward is understanding how galaxies are, are put together. And here is a visual image up here of a galaxy called M81. And here's the infrared picture of that same galaxy. And immediately you can see that this blue part in the center are, is, the, is the stars. The uh, reddish part, these spiral arms, are showing the dust. And then these bright dots which lit up like Christmas tree lights around here are where the stars are being born. So what the infrared allows you to do is for the first time is to sort of dissect the galaxy into its pieces like you dissect a frog in the lab, right? You can dissect this and I can separate now the stars out from the, uh, f from the galaxy uh, and, uh, and I get a separate picture where the dust is in the galaxy. This is, and this has allowed us then to get the mass, the stellar mass, and this is the first time now one has been able to measure the mass of stars in, in, a, in a galaxy. It's a big, another big step forward in un trying to understand how galaxies form. And here's some more images. Uh, here's a M82, which is a, a massive galaxy starting with a very, very active starburst. And then we look in the infrared, you see this hot dust spewing out all over the place from it, mainly from supernova and very hot stars on the inside. You had never seen this by just looking at optical wavelengths. Here's another very interesting example of uh, Centaurus A. Here is an elliptical galaxy here, but it's blocked by this very, very heavy dust lane. And then when we looked in the infrared, we saw this, which is an unusual uh, shape like a parallelogram in the center here. And if, you can't probably see it, but there's two, two jets shooting out here also. So the, this was really a problem. How did such a weird structure ever get into the center of this uh, galaxy? Now I'm going to show you how this happened. I'm going to uh, start a, a, a movie here. And in this movie, we're going to go from visual wavelengths into the infrared. So I'm going to scan through the spectrum. And as I scan through the spectrum, I'm going to go deeper and deeper into the center of that galaxy so I can see what's going on. OK? Okay, we're moving into longer and longer wavelengths now. We're beginning to penetrate inside. Here you can see the, the inside structure. And this is a theoretical model that's been devised to explain that parallelogram. And you see what it is. It's a spiral galaxy that has been warped. So this elliptical galaxy sort of gobbled up the spiral galaxy and consumed it. You can imagine uh, such things are going on in, in a collision. And we'd, again, we'd never have found this out had, had we not looked in the infrared. Okay. Go on further. Here's another one, the Sombrero Galaxy. This is the optical, the visible picture over here. And then we look in the infrared, you can now, the blue is part of the star, the blue is the stellar distribution. So not only could we see on the inside of this galaxy, but we could also see the dust ring around it, 
which is the heated dust in a different uh, infrared bandwidth. Yeah. So again, understanding or trying to understand the structure of this galaxy, we've come a long, long way. And our, our view of the galaxy has been very distorted by just looking at visual wavelengths. So the infrared view of a galaxy is much more informative and typical. Here's another beautiful example of uh, M51. These are two galaxies that collided again. And you can see here, this one, evidently during the collision, lost all its dust. We see no red. The, the red part is dust. And it lost all its dust, and you're just seeing stars as a result of the collision. We would have never determined this just from the optical picture. And also, you can see in here, I don't know if you can't detect it, this very fine feathered-like structure in here, which has given us new information on how the spiral structure formed in the galaxy. Here's another fascinating one. These are two galaxies in collision here. This is the center of one galaxy, and this is the center of the other galaxy. And uh, what is remarkable about here, that if you look at the spiral arms in this galaxy, down in, actually in both of them, there's little beads all along here, which are massive areas of star formation. During the collision, evidently, this triggered massive star formation in the spiral arms of these galaxies. And we're very interested in these collisions because this is the way galaxies were constructed. So we're trying to understand what happens when they collide. And here's another galaxy, uh, M33. Uh, typically, if you looked at this in optical wavelengths, you'd see it's just a small galaxy in here. This blue thing is, again, the stars. The red is the dust. And Spitzer detected dust all the way out to this outer ring out here, which was never seen before. And this is completely changing our view of how galaxies formed. And finally, here is a uh, picture of the center of our own Milky Way. Right is a cluster of stars right there in the center of you. There's perhaps millions and millions of stars. Every one of those little white dots is a star in here. And, there's, uh, and at the center of our own Milky Way is a massive black hole that uh, uh, is, is located there uh, in, 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 inside that uh, cluster of, uh, of stars. It's a beautiful, uh, beautiful picture. And this would have been impossible to get an optical wavelength because there's so much dust in the way that we can't really see the center of our galaxy. And let me close with this one now, which has been another one of the uh, unanticipated discoveries. When we first launched this uh, uh, telescope, one of our main aims was to see how deep we could look into the universe, which meant how far back in time, because light takes travel time, takes light takes time to travel. So looking back in Deep in space is like looking back in time. And what we're anxious to do is find out when the first stars formed and the first galaxies formed in the Big Bang. And here's a, a diagram of this. Here's the explosion. This is time going this way. And you see um, several things happen that I want to point out to you. First, we think the first stars formed when the, when the universe was about 400 million years old. And we think the first galaxies then formed about a, a billion years. The first atoms formed when the universe was about 400,000 years old. So, so we were trying to look back and see if we can see these first stages. It's really been like the holy grail of astronomy to do this. So when we built Spitzer, the, uh, we had set the requirements. And the requirements was to see a galaxies when the universe was 2 billion years old. 2 billion years old. That was our goal. And I think... Uh, looking back at it now, um, had we seen a, 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 we would have see, seen a galaxy at that age, we would have been so excited, it would have been, you know, been like going to heaven. I mean, two billion years old, I could see back that far, you know. Now, what we're doing is we've been able to see back to when the, when uh, we've seen galaxies now at 600 million years old. A, theoreticians tell us that took at least a billion years to form these galaxies. We're seeing massive galaxies uh, at, back at 600 uh, million years, 650 uh, to 800 in that range right now. Massive galaxies, 10 to 100 times the mass of our own galaxy. And not only that, Spitzer can also measure all the stars here in there, and they had to be born at least 300 to 500 million years earlier than that. So the, the theoreticians are scratching their heads, can't figure out how these things got there and how they built up so fast. Okay. 
Unfortunately, I don't think Spitzer will see these first stars of the first galaxy. We'll probably have to wait to the next big mission, which is the uh, Spitzer Space, which is the um, James Webb Space Telescope, which will be launched in um, 2014, and that has a six and a half meter mirror uh, in it. And the way we, f we find these galaxies is we look, I remember I told you that objects way at the edge of the universe have most of their light in the infrared. So we go in here and we look for, this is a, this is a uh, picture from the infrared camera. We look for very, very small, weak dots in here that are very, very red. And we compare this image with, a, say, an image from the Hubble Space Telescope. And you look down below here and you don't see anything in the, in the Hubble and ground-based telescope. Even with the largest telescopes, you don't see anything. But lo and behold, when you look in the infrared, you begin to see objects in here. And this means that from, these, from this distribution of light, then, we can tell how far away the object is. And this one turns out to be uh, at, at, a, uh, at a time when the, uh, when the universe was less than uh, 800 million years old already. And you can see that how, that how bright it turns up. Now, let's look at, you know, this light that made that dot, right? The light that made that dot had been traveling for 13 billion years, right? And in fact, the light left its source before the solar system was ever formed, right? And managed to hit our detector here in orbit around the, around the sun, okay? Incredible. Absolutely incredible. It makes you stop and think, you know? Okay. Okay, just in summary here, the Spitzer Space Telescope really has changed our view of the universe. There's no, no question uh, about it. And imagine this was done with an 85 centimeter mirror, okay, which is even more amazing. As Spitzer has detected the first light from a planet around another star and measured the properties of its atmosphere, including its uh, chemistry and temperature. Uh, Spitzer has enabled us to see into interstellar dust clouds and to have a new view of how stars like our sun were born and evolved. We've seen miniature solar systems may exist around brown dwarfs, and we were able to dissect a galaxy into its component parts of stars, dust, star formation regions, and for the first time measure the mass of stars in a galaxy. And then finally, Spitzer has seen galaxies that are less than 800 million years old and been able to measure their mass and, their, and the ages of uh, their stars uh, in there. So. Um, uh, thank you very much uh, for this award again, uh, Secretary. I really appreciate it. And uh, on behalf of the many people that work with me, and, and uh, uh, it's been a, an incredible, absolutely incredible uh, uh, experience. And I also want to thank the Smithsonian Institution for making uh, an environment in which this type of, type of research can be done. So uh, thank you very much. Here's the, web, the website. and. Uh, uh, you can go and get more information there. So thank you very much. Great. I guess I can take some questions. Don't make them too hard. This is the worst audience to get the questions from are children. They have come up with some of the most impossible questions to answer, really. Uh, yes? Oh, what, the question is, what preceded the Big Bang? Is that what he said? Yes. We really don't know, right? The laws of when you go back in time to the beginning, the laws of physics break down before you can get to when the actual Big Bang occurred. So, so we really don't know what happened there. We just don't know. <laughs> Can I quote you on that in the future? <laughs> yeah, that's really a misnomer. It was, it was not an explosion. You know, that, the trouble is that Big Bang concept le leads to the idea that it was an explosion, right? And it really wasn't. It was an expansion. It was an expansion of space. As the universe expanded, space and time were created. Yeah. And it re really, uh, Big Bang is a terrible misnomer there. Yeah. But let me quote you on that. That's very good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
You, you mean uh, on the, um, uh, in the, in the disk or the planets? On the disk. Yeah, that's very typical. That's very typical of the disk that we've looked at, yeah. Yeah. And in fact, there's some, I, unfortunately, there's, I, I could go on for several hours here uh, showing you pictures that you didn't see. You should go to the website. You can see many more of these. But there's actually evidence now of water raining in on that disk. There's w one example we have of water actually raining in on that disk that's, that, that's surrounding the newborn star there. I'm sorry, the... Oh, the brown dwarf, yeah, the, the temperature of a brown dwarf can be like 1,000 degrees, 2,000 degrees, something like this. Yeah. I, I, I'm quoting now, uh, sorry, I'm, I have to, I'm dealing in Kelvin, uh, degrees Kelvin, if you quote that. Jupiter is like 900 degrees Kelvin. So. Nine, I'm sorry, uh, 90 degrees Kelvin, yeah, 90 degrees Kelvin. Yeah, who was Spitzer? Very good. Mm -hmm. Lyman Spitzer was a very famous astronomer, at pre professor at Princeton uh, University, and he is uh, remembered because he was the pioneer who really first proposed that we ought to get telescopes up into space. And uh, from his work, eventually the, the Hubble Space Telescope came about. So, Uh, throughout, let me, uh, throughout the, the career or which, which or yes, uh, oh yes, well I, th I think it's, it's very interesting um, that the, um, most of the big changes I've seen have come mainly once we've got these great observatories up. Hubble was launched in 1990. And once we had those up, those were the big changes that occurred. For example, in the size, Hubble, the major contributor to understanding the size of the universe and its expansion rate, things like this. And so um, uh, getting above, and like I said, uh, once we had these four great observatories up in space, and uh, supplemented, of course, by the major ground-based work that was going on, I think that appeared. You've got to remember that for most of the history of uh, the human race, we were confined to that very narrow band of electromagnetic spectrum to view the whole universe in. Huh? Then, uh, around the Second World War, after that, when we got started getting into space, that's what happened, you know. So, so from about 1960s to the present, we've been living, and it's been really becoming more and more so, we've been living in a real golden, I, I call it a platinum age of astronomy. And uh, that's when all the breaks started occurring. Huh? And. Uh, and look, at the, the two major discoveries of Spitzer, we did not think of on the day of launch. We had no idea we were going to do this. It's, what, it's another lesson in that to keep an open mind, you know, when you build things and make them as general as possible. That's also another important... I get very philosophical as I get older, I'm afraid. But. Yeah, that's right. No, nothing can escape. There's a minor point called Hawking radiation, which don't not ask me to explain, and I won't. But uh, of get, uh, coming out of a black hole, but most of, once you fall in, you, once you get, you get near the Schwarzschild radius of a black hole, once you get inside that, you're gone. That's it. It's a very interesting problem because at the center of the black hole should be an infinite density, and infinite density is not real. And so, but we know black holes exist. So there's some conundrum there, actually, too, that has, still has to be solved. Yeah. Yes, right. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Well, first, these detectors were first made, and first, I first came across them when I visited the Goddard Space Flight Center one time, visiting the scientist there I knew, and he opened up his drawer, and there was a drawer was full of these uh, rejects of uh, infrared array detectors. And this one, we were still using a single detector at the time. And I asked him where he got them from, and he told me it was from the Aerojet Corporation. And uh, I said, do other infrared astronomers know you have these? <laughs> and he said, no, no. I said, you come with me. Then. And, and this basically is where we got started in doing it. But the trouble is the military looks at high background. They're looking at very hot missiles, or they're looking down at the ground. And by the way, infrared um, 
uh, uh, infrared cameras have become very useful. For example, you know, you've probably seen them in doing thermal analysis of your homes or buildings where the heat is leaking at. And the fire departments use them because they can see through the dust, the same as I described here, and see uh, warm bodies you know, in the smoke that would normally not be visible to them. So they're very, very popular. They use them to uh, check horse races, uh, horses before the race so there's no broken bones in their, their inflammation and everything. Uh, it can be used to detect breast cancer. Uh, people have used it for that and everything. So there's many, many applications. But anyway, uh, as a result of that, it, it was a problem. First of all, the, the, um, the military uh, develops these arrays for, for high background, large fluxes of infrared. We wanted just the opposite. So we took them and then we had to invest a lot of money. In fact, it took us 10 years to, to build those arrays uh, that are, um, were in Spitzer. And, um, and we had to, um, uh, to build them to first work at colder temperatures than the military had because we wanted to make them more sensitive. And so we had to make quite a few changes and everything. But all of this, through the whole development of Spitzer, these arrays, and how they were built were all under the ITAR regulation, the International Trade and Arms Regulations. And every, all our papers are stamped with ITAR. We could not hire any non-U.S. Uh, citizens to work on this uh, experiment and every, anything to do this. And it was all very, very carefully uh, controlled. Yeah. Now it's much more, it's much more open. Uh, the technology has been built up in other um, areas of the world, and now they, they're, it's a little bit easier to get them out of the country. And, Japan now has them in their, some of their satellites, too. So it's, it's gotten easier from, from that time. But in the beginning, it was pretty rough uh, trying to break these uh, loose. Yeah. There's a lot of beautiful images of reds and blues. Yes. Uh -huh. How arbitrary is the assignment of color to the Yeah. It, it really is. It is somewhat arbitrary. That's right. What we try to do, for example, is short wavelength um, uh, light, we make blue, long wavelength infrared radiation, we make red. So we try to match the colors in the, uh, in the visible spectrum. So that's usually done most of the time that way, but it is quite arbitrary. And in fact, you can completely change the, if you want the beauty of the picture by playing around with those colors. But they, once you know the, uh, once you know the, uh, they, they do, rep each color does represent, uh, a, 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 yeah, and as I said before, with each wavelength there's a temperature. So the short wavelength infrared, the blue light that I showed you were always hot objects. Normally they were stars, very hot objects. The red was hot duh, a little bit longer in wavelength. And then the, the real longest stuff, the cool stuff, the greens and everything were the very longest uh, wavelength, very cold dust. And so there is some, it's not completely arbitrary, but there's some madness to our scheme. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Oh, one more question. Okay. <laughs> yeah, nothing. Nothing. It's very interesting that when I say, when you break a, 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 a say a signal into its components and look at the atoms and molecules there, the furthest galaxies we, we see away, we see the same elements, see the same objects, yeah, nothing nothing really different. You see the same same elements at the furthest reaches of the universe. We see the same same kind of things. Uh, it didn't you know there weren't there's not a different set of elements out there or anything like this. It's the same thing. Yeah. Very uniform actually. Okay, thank you again. It's been great. <laughs>